back on an ecstasy revolution in the chemical generation, a frank and sometimes disturbing account of the impact of ecstasy and club culture on British life. The programme contains strong language. Ten years time the chemical generation will be seen as a youth cultural milestone it brought out a generation much better than the bloody lot who came out of the 80s it allowed a whole generation of young people to free their inhibitions that is something absolutely mega that's huge i think in the last 10 years you've seen a huge change in attitudes to gays a lot of progress in things like racism and i think a lot of that is due to people dancing together and realizing they're not so very different those people that were standing in raves in 1988 they're now designers they're graphic artists they're even politicians and there's a huge wave of creativity which i think comes out of uk club culture <laughs> The greatest significance of acid house culture is it's representative of Britain as being the non-stiff upper lip generation. British people actually having a reputation as being the maddest rather than being the most boring, tame and conservative. Because we're not. We have it large. To an older generation, I'm an 80s pop star. But to a younger generation, I'm a DJ. <laughs> Clubbing as we know it really kicked off in the late 80s with the acid house explosion and raves held in glamorous warehouses like this one. Over the years, I've seen the change in the attitude, the wardrobe and the drugs. And even though every youth movement has had some kind of drug attached to it, none has affected our society quite like ecstasy. The chemical generation has had its triumphs and its tragedies. This is its story. <laughs> What goes around comes around. The scene today reminds me of the early 80s, when every club had an elitist door policy. Here at Glyph in Covent Garden this evening, a come as your favourite blonde night. One dormer at the Taboo Club even held up a mirror to a hapless punter and said rather cruelly, Do you let yourself in looking like that? There was a real air of exclusivity about the club scene then. You needed shoulder pads and a lampshade hat to get through the door. But then again, that was the 80s. I think that exclusivity within the club culture of the late 80s can be related to the economic exclusivity that was going on at the time. You'd already had the supreme victory of Thatcher, defeat of the miners, defeat of the printers, mass unemployment, uh, greater divisions between the rich and the poor. And at the same time, you had this club scene which was excluding people who didn't dress correctly, didn't have the right accent, and didn't know the right people. And so it was a time where people were depressed and were looking for something. The tiny Balearic island of Ibiza had been a popular package holiday resort with Britain since the 60s. In 1987, a group of British DJs stumbled across the island's emerging club scene. One of them was Nicky Holloway. You went to Ibiza with Oak and Fold and Danny Ramplin. Yeah. And you went to clubs like Amnesia and you experienced this whole kind of... Yeah, we, we, what was called the Balearic scene. What was that like? We, we'd been going there for years as like more just as like normal people on package holidays and just sort of sticking to San Antonio. Doing this sort of game around the bar a bit. And we sort of decided we'd have a look at the other side of the island. You know, we went to this club that everybody was talking about called Amnesia. And that's when I first actually took one of these pills that everybody was talking about over there. You know, this called Ecstasy. I'd never heard about it, and I'd never done any, any sort of drugs before in my life. But I thought I'd give it a try because it was a big deal. And we had the most amazing night. It sounds a bit cliched and a bit right on, but it did seem to open our ears and our mind to other cultures and other music. And uh, it was great. I loved it. And that was it for, for, for sort of 10 years afterwards. My first ecstasy experience, like all my following ecstasy experiences, the rush, when it hit, I was sitting on the loo and I was having a crap. And I was staring at the toilet door 
because every single time I, had, I came up, that's where I was. The feeling started in my feet and it was like white fire running through my body. I couldn't believe the sensations I was having. It feels like it steps up your spine. Each one of my spine little rib things is another step. The back of your neck just goes to like putty. When it gets to there, that's when I know I'm home. And then you just look at things and life's just got a whole completely different outlook. I mean, if you put your hands in the air, the tingling sort of ran through your body and you were right in the middle of the music. All my sort of inhibitions were kind of going haywire. This tacky disco in South East London became the greatest party in the world. I felt ten foot taller than everyone and I could see multi-colours flying around and I could hear people talking hundreds of yards away and I could hear it in the ears. It was just the best thing. I wasn't kind of like used to feeling happy. It was a part of me that I've never had but now I've found. And then I thought to myself, now it all makes sense. I thought, I know the way to end all the world's problems, give everyone a pill and make them dance. It all kind of fell into place and I was thinking to myself, why have I never done this before? Why have I never thought of being like this before? Why the fuck ain't the world like this all the time? Why? In Ibiza, people were taking ecstasy, but you've got to understand also that the island was very, very special at that time. You had a very strange mix of people. You had kind of wealthy jet setters, film stars, pop stars there. You got fantastically glamorous Spanish transvestites there. You got kind of like the weirdest people from all of their respective countries, all in a club together. An open air club that was open all night, and you were dancing, and the sun would come up over you. So it was all of that as well as drugs. It wasn't just a drug thing. If you could go back to that first trip to Ibiza, mm -hmm. could you have ever imagined, you know, that 16 years later you'd be involved in such a huge scene? On the way to that, on that trip, no. On the way back from it, yes, because it was pretty obvious, I think, to all of us that we'd fallen on something that was going to change our lives. And you wanted to bring that vibe back to... Absolutely, I mean, it was hard to forget it. If you have something nice, it's natural instinct to want to recreate it whenever you can. <laughs> Recreating the Ibiza atmosphere of all-night open-air parties in rainy old Britain was to prove difficult. Faced with stringent licensing laws, the party scene was forced underground. But Britain was about to be hit by a new wave of music that consisted of a lot more than a few dodgy Spanish holiday records. This is uh, Roundhouse Recording Studios, and I'm looking for Mr. Denny Rampling. Those returning Balearic evangelist DJs brought back with them a whole new way of putting together music, lighting, DJing, and drugs. Um, One of the first clubs for the scene was Shoom, started by Danny Ramplin. Danny, a lot of people sort of credit you as being one of the pioneers of the whole clubbing scene. Do you think that's a fair description? I certainly do, yeah. I certainly helped pioneer the whole thing. And um, that spirit and drive that I had at the beginning of the whole thing, and that awareness of what we had, um, certainly helped the development of the whole scene here in the UK, in fact worldwide really. What was interesting for me is that you had guys that would have punched your teeth in, you know, coming up and embracing you, hugging you, saying, all right George, you're all right mate. <laughs> Do you remember that kind of that whole thing happening? It was very positive, if you look at all the youth movements before, how positive was that? People were coming together, you look at mods and rockers and punks and teds. They were all positive fashion statements, but along with that, there was conflict between different groups of youth. Whereas this thing united everybody together. That was part of the whole idealism. It transcended all class. Maybe some of that was drug fuel with the, with the use of, of ecstasies at all towards that. But there was a lot of genuine love and unity in the air, and the music also contributed to that. Ecstasy had reached British shores and was finding its way into many big city clubs, including Manchester's very first super club, the Hacienda. From being a great club, it suddenly became a life-changing experience. And that's really when the ecstasy had started kicking in. The kind of birth or explosion of, of ecstasy in, in Manchester was really, really quick. It was almost like a Mexican wave. <laughs> it was that quick, you know, over maybe a week or two weeks. 
people at this end had started going mad and then it just crept and then after a couple of weeks the whole place was just hanging from the rafters. It was madness. People would be dancing everywhere. You know, they'd be dancing on the stairs, in the cloakroom queue, in the toilet queue, you know, the whole building. It was just shaking. It was fantastic. In the early days, we'd go to Camden Palace on a Friday, there'd be 3,000 people in the club, but there'd be just one tiny corner, and in this tiny corner there may be like 200 people, and they'd be screaming ecstasy, ecstasy, and everybody else looking at them thinking, what are they going on about? And then in the space of a month, the whole building was then shouting ecstasy. One witness to the ecstasy wave that was sweeping the country was law graduate turned DJ, Judge Jules. Do you think the acid house scene could have existed without ecstasy? Do you think the music was enough by itself? Yeah, the fundamental thing was the music. Uh, and without that, there would have been no acid house movement. And ecstasy was important, but I think that ecstasy would have been popular in all places where there was a gathering of young people who, whether they take it long term, like to experiment recreationally with drugs. And I think ecstasy exists outside um, dance culture because it's just what young people do. Having said that, it did become a popular drug around the same time as dance culture reached on mass proportions. One of the interesting things is the ecstasy and the use of that drug acted as this kind of pacifier and really kind of created this sort of love generation thing. It's difficult to know whether ecstasy actually changed British society for good, but I'm sure it's no coincidence that football hooliganism vanished overnight in 88 and 89. The late 70s and early 80s were violent times gangs, not just football, but council estate gangs, political gangs, all sorts of gangs were, were around. And then ecstasy came along and people got chilled. People got chilled. You'd find yourself in a warehouse party that was dark and then like seven o'clock in the morning when it became light, you find that you're in the room and there's half a Millwall in there, half a Chelsea in there, half of Arsenal in there. But um, everyone just looked at everyone and said, what a great party. And then violence sort of declined because people were just too busy having a good time to think about anything else. I think what you had is a whole generation who'd had nothing really to call their own. Um, since punk, there hadn't been a big musical movement. So I think for a whole lot of people, they felt they'd found something that gave them an identity, that made them part of a big gang. Um, and also, it was a hell of a lot of fun. And it wasn't a time when there was a lot of fun about. Everybody who went to one of these events went back the next time with five friends. So you started with events for about 2,000 people. Within a year, it had been pushed out to the fields outside the M25. And you were talking 20, 25,000 people at some of the big events. I was sitting in a pub on a Sunday afternoon, I got talking to a chap that told me it's really hard to find places to put these raves on. Um, and at that point, I kind of thought, hang on, I know about 50 or 60 plots of land. And a little light went on in my head and just went, opportunity. Because I was sort of arranging these commercial loans for all these people, like Asda and Texas and Sainsbury's, to build on around the M25. You could phone up the farmer and just basically make him an offer to hire his land for the weekend. Following instructions via mobile phone recorded messages, revelers flocked in their thousands to secret locations around the M25, causing complete mayhem. My first experience as pay park is as the commander of a very large area that was surrounded by the M25 was an unusually large amount of traffic uh, up and down the motorways on Friday and Saturday evenings and this traffic never started until about quarter to twelve to one o'clock in the morning which was a most unusual time to have traffic on your motorways and I began to get the impression then that I had a problem to put it mildly. I didn't really ever know where I was going in particular we just used to all follow each other. There's been about seven or eight of us in a little escort all looking for this field. There's this feeling of naughtiness you know, you're a desperado. The feeling was fantastic, very much like we all knew a secret. You never really knew whether it was going to happen or not, or you'd be in the middle of a field and then there'd somebody come along in a little metro and tell you it's in another field 20 miles up the road. And you'd get out your car and you'd hear the tunes pumping and you'd think, well, oh, this is great. <laughs> I 
think forbidden fruit often tastes sweeter and I think people embrace this pirate identity of the illegal race with great fervour. There's nothing more exciting than outwitting a big battalion of police and letting rip its party afterwards. <laughs> The great thing was finding them. You'd be lost for hours and hours and hours. You'd drive over a hill and suddenly there it was, this kind of like fantasy world built for you, you know. It was incredibly exciting. It was also an incredibly exciting time. A lot of the people involved in this really did think it was going to change everything. It changed them personally a lot, opened them up to a lot of things. Therefore, they thought it would change the world. But the amazing thing that was going on at the same time was the Berlin Wall did come down. Nelson Mandela did walk out of prison. There were huge changes going on in the world that felt like part of this. It was a very euphoric time. One person whose life was transformed by Acid House was the now best-selling author of Train Spotting, Irvin Welsh. Do you think that um, Acid House could have been as popular as it was without ecstasy? I don't think it probably would have existed in any mainstream form without ecstasy. I don't think the music would have made any, any sense without it. I mean, um, it's like kind of sort of uh, pub culture without alcohol. You know, just the, the two just went together. I mean, nobody would have stood in the field in the freezing cold in Scotland in the late 80s, you know, unless they had something inside them. You know, it wasn't, you're not going to, they're not going to dance in, a, in a, a cold field all night long. You know, it just wouldn't have made any sense. And do you think that, I mean, ecstasy worked so well because it looked like a sort of headache pill, you know, it just looked like a very sort of nice chemical. Nice and very <laughs> easy to take, you know, <laughs> you think it's so uh, well, this can't really do me that much damage, you know, it's not like I'm cooking up this uh, this mixture and banging it into my veins or, you know, chasing it from a bit of oil and sitting there. We're just sitting there with this nice little pill and I'm going to take it and wash it down with some water and I'll be all, I'll be happy. <laughs> It really was quite a bizarre scene. You could hear the music for five and a quarter miles. We had the decibels checked. And I thought I'd had a fun fair set up on me that I hadn't any local knowledge of. That was my first impression until I said to my drug squad, get me everything you can on ecstasy. And they took about 48 hours. But when they arrived on my desk, I realized that this is nothing about people wanting to party. This is people that actually want to take drugs. <laughs> As more and more people joined the party, you didn't have to be the brightest of journalists to realise the potential for a story. When you had this initial coverage, it was mildly positive and it was seen as another sort of tame and rather silly youth cult. Smiley t-shirts for sale. In the building above we've got Acid House uh, smiley face t-shirts. But then there was this sudden realisation, oh no, what, what have we done? We're advertising a drug cult. Immediately they pulled these t-shirts off sale and started running these heavy duty editorials about the evils of pushers targeting our pop kids. Media pressure meant that the police had to be seen to be doing something. Our policy has been to stop these parties because they're unlicensed and because of our concerns for public order and indeed public safety. By this time, we were turning out 250 plus police officers on a Saturday night, and we'd started using helicopters for spotting. But every time I stepped up a tactic, they would step up a tactic against me. My boyfriend at the time was a printer, getting to print off a load of, you know, moody flyers like drugs tonight with a big smiley face. Oh, Sheriff London, all meet in Croydon or whatever. And then we get one of our friends' mums to go into the police station and say, oh, I found this in my son's bedroom. I think it's for an illegal raid. So the Acid Squad and Ken Patterson all go down to South London. Meanwhile, we're going up the M1 on our way to Buckinghamshire. We then started to do what Sunrise did. We got our own radio station and we started to relay messages, sending people all over the place. Again, it went wrong. We sent them to Colchester one night where they smashed two garages up on the way and looted them completely. Police and local authorities have clashed with party goers over noise and traffic nuisance, sustaining injuries and making many arrests. 
At a certain point, you have this kind of really heavy sort of police involvement because you know there was there was stuff in all the tabloids and there was a huge reaction. Do you remember at, at what point that kind of all changed and became really kind of a huge thing? At the time, the whole issue of pay parties was a much more grey area legally. Um, subsequently, there were a number of I would call them draconian bits of legislation brought in to counteract pay parties. But because it was a grey area, the bigger promoters realised that the thing to do was to have an on-site lawyer. So you'd have these kind of heated debates about the legality of these events between the on-site lawyer and a very senior policeman. And it was literally down to the wire whether the event would take place, dependent on the ability of the lawyer to persuade the policeman that, yes, this did fall within the confines of the law. The minute we touched their equipment, they would lay a counterclaim for damage to equipment or for harassment, whatever you like to think of, uh, they came at us with. I was taken out every agency I could find and of course these um, organisers feared the Batman more than they feared us, to be honest with you. There's no doubt that the powers weren't good enough for the police really to do the job effectively. Well, it was a game of cat and mouse and we always won. Uh, sorry, Ken Tappenden, but we got you. I can't uh, go along with the fact that they won. I'm, I'll be prepared to call it nearly a draw, but I think we won because we stopped it all in 18 months. All right, we drove it underground and we drove it to warehouses and the violence increased, uh, the problems increased. In 1990, the government introduced a law which made it illegal to hold raids in fields around the M25 without a proper license. But the promoters would not give up. Many returned to the cities to find alternative locations. The innovation that was made here was to start using unconventional premises like abandoned buildings, you know, these sort of relics of Thatcher's destruction of the British manufacturing industry were taken up by a new generation who gave them new meaning. Genesis was just basically about doing different events in different locations. You know, we'd break into a warehouse, 100,000 square foot, move sound and lights into there. You know, I'd put a suit on and I'd basically go out to the police and tell them that I was George Michael's personal manager or whoever came into my mind at that time. In those days, the promoters were gone. You know, we were earning, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds. But, you know, we were young, we were like 21 years old, and it went as fast as we earned it. We were buying the, the Porsches and the Mercedes and the 30 grand watches. So, yeah, on Saturday, we'd have 150 large, but by Wednesday, it'd been spent. <laughs> this dance culture, people involved in that really are Thatcher's children. That's what we are. So it was shaped by Thatcher's ideas of entrepreneurial, go-getting, go-for-it type of culture but people involved reinterpreted those ideas to suit themselves. They were going to be entrepreneurs, but it may not be on the right side of the law. Even though the, the intelligence office has only been running a few months, we've got some very firm evidence about uh, major criminals involved, major criminal organizations, drugs, protection rackets, all at the background of these parties. I think the thing about drugs is, as well as ecstasy being very enjoyable, it's also illegal. And one of the things about the huge rise in the number of drugs consumed in this country over that period is there's also been enormous amounts of money put into the hands of really deeply unpleasant people. To me, drugs were an easy way out. They were. They were such an easy way out of a bad situation. The bad situation was there was nothing. No one was offering me a job. No one's offering me love. No one's offering me nothing. If you answer the phone and you get 50 quid, ain't that a good phone call? That is a fucking brilliant phone call. Getting 50 quid for a game, hello? Yeah, right, I'll see you in 10 minutes. To me, that is a way of life which is brilliant. All of a sudden, I was in the limelight. I was the man to be. You got my phone number? Uh -huh, you know the right man. The hello, mate, where you're from, you know, all that, the, the, the matey bit that started to go with the rougher element of it, so to speak. I mean, you know, there was obviously a lot of money to be made in the mass selling of ecstasies that brought in elements of people that you used to go clubbing and get away from. You and know? you were going to these venues and there were like security guards with yeah, like rock guns and, and, and rock wilders, and it wasn't that happy, loved up vibe all of a sudden. It was a heavy vibe. I can remember going to, you know, some of the big ways and as you were walking in, you know, you had people coming up saying, Trips Eve. Yeah, East Charlie. Trips Charlie. East Trips Charlie. I mean, yeah. everywhere you went, people were yeah. offering you stuff. I mean, and 
in the early days of Master Class, it was a little bit more, you know, you didn't, it wasn't so in your face. Yeah, it was a bit yeah. more secretive. Exactly. You do, you, I mean, the, what you found was when you go out for a night out, you don't want somebody offering you stuff. You, all right, you want to be able to find it if you want it. You want to be able to ask and be able to get it. That's how, that was the, that was the, the, I don't know, the etiquette of it was. You wanted, you wanted it there if you wanted it. But the last thing you wanted was a corridor full of people driving you mad offering you stuff. It was quite well organised. You know, there'd be meetings during the week where rival dealers, instead of going round another dealer's house and, and wrecking him and putting him out of business, they'd approach the doorman and they'd say, how much rent is he paying you to sell drugs in your club? And if they say grand, they'd say, well, we'll give you 1500 for a return on that sort of rent, dealers in London I know might make eight grand a weekend, which is a lot of dough, do you know what I mean? You've got me selling tens and the twenties in single pills. Then you've got Mr. Next Man Up who's selling the hundred pills to people like me. But then you've got the man who's sitting there saying, well, I'm earning 200 grand a night and I'm being absolutely jack shit for nothing. My boys are earning me my money. <laughs> We'd seen this whole culture develop and all this positivity and it was, it was so depressing when other elements started infiltrating it. There was nothing we could do because we weren't the kind of people who were going to do battle with them and it got very nasty in Manchester. If you know that someone's got £50,000 in their pocket, you haven't got to go and rob a bank. You've only got to hide behind a bush with a shotgun and you've got them. And of course you had organisers, good organisers, uh, nice people breaking the law, but I could cope with that, uh, who were frightened of that type of violence. What I thought had happened was the chair had been thrown off the balcony and landed near me because I heard a bang and as I was dancing I just saw loads and loads of faces running past me screaming and um, what was actually happening was people being shot, you know, and it was the gunshots and gangland in the Hacienda. They all went downhill really, quickly, you know, until the club was closed because there was guns all over the place. Go, 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 go! Yeah, the Acid House unit finally caught up with the party organisers and heavy sentences were imposed. It's a warning to others who are still organising uh, paid Acid House parties that they get caught, they're going to get 10 years plus. Thanks to see tablets, and this has just been picked up off the floor. Well, as drug taking became normalised became an ordinary Saturday night activity. Criminality was effectively democratised. We all became criminals. But I think it really created a feeling of disrespect for the law, the feeling in the classic cliche, the law is an ass. In 1994, a second piece of legislation was introduced, the Criminal Justice Bill. <laughs> Acid House Ravers were being lumped together with hunt saboteurs. You want another go? Squatters and new age travellers, as the government tried to deal with all the undesirables at the same time. The result was the first opposition culture since the anti-nuclear demonstrations of the early 80s. Oh, oh, this whole kind of shift in people's kind of culture and their consciousness this whole idea about money being the kingpin was kind of being broken down and events like that just helped push that consciousness along i think also you had a lot of kind of single politics come out of it i think a lot of kids kind of got into the environment you know protecting the environment good morning Columbia. what are the conditions like down there down that side huh? yeah no bad was ecstasy the, the full reason for that? Who knows? But I mean, it certainly did a lot to make them far more open to things that they wouldn't be before. The Criminal Justice Act didn't have any effect whatsoever on mainstream clubbing. By then, they'd already granted all-night licences to clubs like the Ministry of Sound. And there's no need to go riding out into the countryside, pay 25 quid for something that may or may not happen, may end up in you being chased by the police all night, may end up with you getting rained on in a field. If you could actually go into a really nice club in the centre of your city, and do the same thing. I think we took the, the sort of 
those people that didn't quite want to stand in a muddy field on a rainy Saturday. They didn't want their coat thrown on the floor. They didn't want to sit on that sort of rave slush that you used to always get on the floors. So I don't know where it came from. But they wanted to come somewhere where they knew it was a sort of safe, well-managed environment. I sort of like to think that Ministry of Sound is a sort of civilised raving. You know, we get letters from people that say it was really good not to be approached at every dark corner by the same bloke six weeks running offering me, offering me ecstasy and checking other people's £20 notes in the light to see if they were real. While the super clubbers were cleaning up, the high street clubs were about to experience a tragedy that would shock the nation. I was here doing it, reckon I was in Basildon, and um, a girl called Leah Betts used to come in the club, and through a network of friends, she'd been supplied ecstasy from our club um, for her 18th birthday party. An Essex teenager is in a coma after taking a... Leah Betts from Latchingdon near Maldon collapsed at her 18th birthday party. After she'd taken the pill, she collapsed. She was in a coma. The parents were sitting by the bedside. They issued this photo to the press of this young English rose, this flower of Middle England, daughter of a copper, lying in a coma, having taken the illegal drug. And that hysteria really mounted over that week. What's going to happen to them? Are they going to switch the life support off? It was as if the police, newspaper editors, the public, had suddenly discovered this invisible world what they thought was weird, freaky druggies was actually their own kids. I think the effect her death had was that every parent in the country thought, God, that could have been my child. And I think for the first time, kind of Middle England, mainstream Britain, realised kind of like how widely these drugs were consumed. And I think one of the things about the kind of unfolding story of Leah was like, you remember seeing her dad go, we will get this evil pusher. But love for my daughter. I've got anger for the people with the drugs, and I hate this bastard that supplied them. And the pushers turned out not to be evil at all, but a chain of her best friends, none of whom were making money, just passing pills along as favours, which is actually what drug dealers are in this country on the, on the lower level. It's all friends helping out friends, and we would achieve nothing by putting these people in prison for 10 years. And I think that was the first time kind of mainstream Britain understood that. To me, it was, it was the strongest case for kind of putting drugs into a legal framework so that uh, people had some quality control, they knew what they were taking. If you were buying alcohol, you know, you want to go to an off-license to buy it, you wouldn't want somebody distilling it in their garden shed. This is what you've got with the drugs culture. Because it's illegal, it's underground, you don't know where it's coming from. I mean, do you think drugs should be legalised? I think there's a strong case now for putting them in a completely different legal framework and um, making sure that people have got safe drugs because you're not going to stop people taking them now. It's, just, it's in the culture. It's ingrained in there, so I think that's got to be accepted. Everyone's shit scared of selling that pill that kills someone. But at the end of the day, if you're willing to hand over a tenner to give me a tenner for something that you're willing to take yourself, sorry, sod's law, isn't it? It is an occupational hazard. If you take that, if you're willing to buy it, you're willing to eat it. If you ain't willing to eat it, don't buy it. The thing about the about the Leah Betts, it was a, it was a tragedy, but I don't really think it had that much effect on how much ecstasy people took. In fact, I think more people take ecstasy now than they did in 1988. I would say probably a hundred times more. It's become the currency of clubland. Witness to the changing face of clubland is another 80s pop star turned DJ, superstar DJ in fact, Jeremy Healy. In terms of kind of like the whole. <laughs> Drug culture thing, you know, every weekend there are kids right. dancing their heads off, popping ease, not worried no matter how much bad press they read, no matter how many scares there are, going out and just going for it and really enjoying themselves. And, and do you think sort of drug use is much more widespread now than it was, say, 15 years ago? Yeah, it's much more commonplace and that's just the, the way it is and I don't think there's anything anyone can do to change that. You know, I just think that it is a part of everyday life and has been demonised and needs to be dealt with, you know, in, a, in an adult way. It's, not, it's a bit like sex, you can't sort of push it underneath the carpet and pretend that it doesn't go on. And uh, to be honest with you, the number of people who have died from it and the column inches 
surrounding it do not equate. You know, like I know literally 20 people who have died from lung cancer from cigarettes. So I find it offensive to say that ecstasy is dangerous when they sell cigarettes around the corner. You know? If I were to look back over the last 11 years since the uh, alleged craze uh, was really in its development stages to what it is today, I wonder really whether the amount of time, resources, money um, that has been ploughed into this has been all worth it. I know there have been deaths. Uh, one death is one too many. But I don't think there's been more deaths through Class A drugs than there has through some of the other things that we are encountering in our day's life today. Despite the police and government's best efforts, Acid House became assimilated into everyday culture. Even the football anthem for the 1990 World Cup campaign was originally called Ears for England. A phrase that Jimmy Hill would have no doubt misunderstood. Then there was Blair, who even used an ecstasy anthem for his mass sing-along at the 1997 election campaign. Something that could never have been imagined ten years before. In 1988, Radio 1 wasn't playing dance music. In fact, Radio 1 hated the records, you know. Peter Powell said it was mass zombiedom. That's how much Radio 1 understood Acid House. So it's amazing how big it's got. Without a shadow of a doubt, the big breakthrough came in 1987, when a couple of DJs got together before the days of samplers and mixed together 500 records to make the classic number one hit, Pump Up the Volume. Pump up the volume, pump up the volume, pump up the volume, this, this. DJ, looking back, do you see how significant Pump Up the Volume was? It was significant to me as, as a radio thing, you know, on the radio, there wasn't a lot of dance music being played apart from the Pirates, but suddenly Radio 1 took it on. You know, and then DJs obviously going in the studio and starting to make their own records too. And that record, in a, in a sense, kind of started a whole new trend because suddenly maybe we were responsible for kind of making DJs a little bit more important. Um, well, in a way, yeah. I mean, I, don't, I mean, it's, it opened the door. Pop stars were suddenly replaced and DJs became the new attraction, earning outrageous amounts of money. Paul Oakenfold was rumoured to earn a six-figure sum for playing on New Year's Eve. Not a bad night's work for playing other people's records. DJ has become a superstar because who else has been to focus on? You've got like anonymous producers sitting in back rooms. They're not Mr. Gorgeous in any way. Then you've got the clubbers themselves. How can we turn them into a brand? How can we make money out of them as a brand? You can't. Really, the DJ is the only human figure who could be taken and marketed. There was a need for a star and the DJ had to be it. It's very strange now. I, I've, I've been to a couple of clubs recently. They've had superstar DJs on and they get this big kind of fanfare and introduction onto the stage and they walk out and go, well, you yeah, and you think, oh, you're, not, you're not World Federation wrestlers, you know what I mean? You're supposed to be providing the soundtrack for the club. And the weirdest thing for me is the audience kind of stand as if they're at a gig, looking at the DJ playing records, which that never happened in, in our days, you know? The DJ should have been heard and not seen, really. One man who may disagree is DJ Pete Tong, who has his own successful Radio 1 dance show, runs a label, supervises soundtracks for feature films, and even has his name in the dictionary. Before sort of Acid House, you know, the DJ was just some bloke in the corner that, you know, played records. Oh, totally. We were the failures because, you know, everybody I know that wanted to start DJing at that time actually really wanted to be a musician, you know. I wanted to be a drummer. I, you know, I was such a terrible drummer. I decided to play someone else's records. It made a better noise. So no one knew, obviously, where it was going to end up or what it was going to be like today. But um, I did it because I couldn't dance. <laughs> the only way I pull birds. I mean, one of the sort of legacies, I suppose, of this generation is that we've been able to do something that most of our parents would never have had the chance to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this whole self-employment thing. Definitely. No, it's exciting times. And that's why, you know, I think being a DJ is figuring on more people's, you know, job applications or, you know, job well, desires. And, and it's, 
It is, you know, I've, I've read it somewhere, you know, more turntables are sold than Fender Stratocasters. One, uh, one guitar to nine pairs of decks yeah. being yeah, sold. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. A lot of the people I've spoken to, um, especially some of the older DJs, have said that, you know, they're quite happy to be behind the decks, yeah. but they couldn't see themselves kind of jumping up and down. Yeah. And there has been this move into this whole kind of bar culture. Yeah. And, you know, people are using cocaine more than they were 10 years ago. Do you think this is just a case of people getting old and wanting to be more sophisticated? Uh, pro probably some of it's designed by the desire of some of the club runners not, not to want to give up, you know. I mean, it's almost like, uh, well, we don't want to stop going out. We still want to be with you guys, but we're just going to be around the corner here with our, you know, <laughs> the designer double suits, vodka so. and tonic. So it's like, it's, it's, you know, some of it's driven by, yeah, I suppose it's like um, uh, wanting to keep involved. And in the corner, there is the DJ still. I think there's lots of people who sort of grew up in clubs, who moved on, who wanted something a bit more sophisticated, somewhere where they could sit and have a meal and a drink with their mates, weren't particularly concerned with getting sweaty anymore, but they wanted the same kind of really nice surroundings, hence the rise of the designer bar. The point is, for all of the anti-e propaganda, most people quite simply grow out of it. It's not perceived by the first generation of clubbers as being necessarily cool anymore. We all know it's like to see a teenager going through their rites of passage, drunk for the first time in a pub, puking up, being silly. We look at it and we think, well, that's a little bit immature, that's a bit naff, that's a bit uncool. And it's become the same with people taking pills. If you see someone going in at you and going, oh, Emily Red, what's your name, what's your name again? After that, it just becomes tight and you just think, oh, I'm not too, you know, it reminds you of your own initial uncool behaviour. Lisa Lau has been around since the early days of Ibiza and was one of the first successful female house DJs. Over the last five years there's been this real return to kind of um, bar culture. Yeah. Do you think it's our kind of generation kind of growing up and wanting to be a bit more sophisticated? Yeah, basically. I do. I think that we're all ten years older. We want to go somewhere that's a little bit more intimate and we want to start mixing with people our own age. I think there's nothing like adult conversation and not what did you have tonight and you know your music's wicked. So you know, I think that it is, yeah, yeah, definitely a case of us moving on. And also there's been a kind of return to sort of cocaine mm. use because I think a lot of people see cocaine as a more sophisticated drug and yeah. it's a more grown up drug. Do you, do you think that's true? I, I think that it's definitely something that people think. It's almost like stereotypical, do you know what I mean? Well I go to these places now and drive this car so I've got to be spending £50 a night on my drug. Cocaine is such a major player in nightlife. I'd say probably more than ease at the moment. You know, it's everywhere. With the lifestyle and everything that came with the promoting and the DJing and flying around the world and everything like that, you know, I got into cocaine. started very much as like having the odd line of someone else's and then it was uh, getting half a gram to share with a mate and then it was like a gram at the weekends and it was one every night I went out and then I was out every night so it's every night and all that happened over a period of 10 years it didn't happen overnight I didn't become a cocaine addict overnight but I did end up there anyone who does a lot of cocaine basically turns into an arsehole you won't accept it yourself but you do you know I was a perfect example of that Do you think that's a kind of a natural consequence of the whole acid house no, movement? I think, no, I don't think so. You don't think one no, thing led to I, another? I think, I think, well, all that chain of events thing, you know, that one thing leads to another, you know, that's like saying if you have a beer, you're going to have that, you know. I, I never smoked spliff, I've never done crack, never done heroin, but I was a big time cocaine addict and, uh, you know, loved my pills. But, so I, I never tried the others and never really wanted to. So how, I can't justify that in my own yeah. head as being... But do you think that the sort of things like ecstasy and cocaine are considered kind of clean drugs? Yeah, well, cocaine and ecstasy are socially acceptable. If you think about any one thing that was a kind of positive that's come out of this whole kind of mass dance culture explosion, what would it be for you? I would like, you know, although we took it, you know, we took the music initially from Chicago and New York and we took the huge influences from that booth in terms of mixing up the music, I think 
Britain's got something to be really proud of, or the, you know, the UK, in, in, in that what we've been doing here for the last 10 to 15 years, everyone wants to mimic. It's really put the youth culture to the fore. I mean, we're far more internationally famous than the Americans for youth culture now. If we hadn't done what we did at the end of the 1980s, British pop music would have, would have died. The whole scene, all the clubs, everything would have gone. Those kids that were giving out flyers at the beginning of the 90s are now, they're owning the building, and I think that's a really great conclusion at the end of the millennium. I think it made a lot of people feel better about themselves and about each other, and uh, it energised a lot of people and made them do positive things. It gave an awful lot of people who didn't have much of a chance of doing something opportunities. Lots and lots of little businesses grew up around the club scene. People opening record shops, printing t-shirts. If you want to buy a record, buy one called Definitely Maybe by Oasis, because that came out of that culture. And you want to see a film, go and see Trainspotting, because that came out of that culture as well. It's probably everywhere. Design, cars, restaurants, magazines. The influence of people that went clubbing when they were 20 years older are now 30 can be seen right across Britain. We are the first generation with no allegiance to wartime values. You know, it's when you look back on paid news and you see these sort of images of British people as being very conservative with small c and stiff upper lip. It just does not tally with what I see when I go out to clubs and people just go absolutely mad. I just think it's so sad that older people still perceive us as being po-faced and boring because we're not. It kind of destroyed sexism but increased sexuality. There was less of a sense of the old kind of sexual stereotypes. I think people learn a lot more than you'd expect about each other on the dance floor. The fact you were black, white or yellow, you were in a field in 1988 dancing to the same music has to have some sort of lasting effect. I became less of a snob, which made me more open to other people. It's kind of nice thinking that all these people are now out there doing interesting new things. And it really has changed the landscape that we're living in now. There's a flip side to that, though, in that we know other people who uh, dropped out of college and probably would have had quite a promising career and, you well, know, yeah. got a bit yeah. fucked up as a result. There's so many dealers out there. There's so many people. Everyone knows someone that's selling pills or weed or whatever. Um, and you just like ringing up for a pizza. If you could think of any one thing that was a negative that's come out of this, what would it be? Uh, people dying. Um, you yeah, know, that was obviously never meant to happen. It had a lot of martyrs that shouldn't have had. Talking about people like Leo Betts, it's horrible that people died when they shouldn't have died. People have been taking E for 10, 15 years, but they still don't know really what it does to you. So that's the thing that is a little bit daunting. People don't really go out during the week anymore because they don't trust themselves. It's a bit like a lot of people can't go out without using drugs anymore. As we head into the future, Gatecrasher in Sheffield is being hailed as the next big thing. Every weekend, hundreds of kids are dressing up to the nines and losing the plot on the dance floor. This is the new chemical generation, whose only connection to Acid House is the legacy that it left behind. And even though some skeptics say that Clubland is over, one visit to this place would certainly prove otherwise. One of the root stems of the popularity of club culture is the fact that in an environment where less and less we know our neighbours, we're more and more scared of crime. Clubs and Clubland represents the last bastion of an opportunity to meet people you've never met before on a kind of equal footing. And ultimately the human race is a social race. We want to go out and meet people, but we're given very few opportunities to do it in a non-threatening environment. And that's what will keep club culture important until the year dot, as far as I'm concerned. People will be dancing to the bomb drops, you know. I don't think it's ever going to end. As long as people are moving on, making new dance music, the scene's always going to be evolving. But it's going to go somewhere else. Something else is going to come along and replace it. I mean, you went through the, the punk scene, and when that happened, you thought, God, what could ever replace this? It was so new, refreshing, and unique. And Acid House was also that way. But I certainly believe that something else will come along and replace it at some point. For a radical youth movement, it might not be music. You might be looking in the wrong place, it might be ice hockey or something. <laughs> I think clubs always will exist and they're places where people can kind of experiment and then go back to the real world and be their normal selves. And I think drugs, hallucinogenics, some way of kind of losing yourself and forgetting who you are or turning into something new will always be evolved with them. But also I think it's true that people will always grow out of it, slow down and calm down. And it's not something we should really worry too much about. As a result of the ecstasy revolution, some say we're far too dependent on chemicals. 
In my opinion, we've been hooked for years. It could be dropping a Prozac for depression or a Class A drug to go dancing. But either way, chemical consumption is now ingrained in our culture. It's in our environment, it's in our water, even in our food. So where do you draw the line? Ecstasy had been around for 70 years, but only when it coincided with dance culture did it really find its moment. I'm quite sure the drug of the future has already been created and is lying in some laboratory drawer somewhere, just waiting for its time and place. Thank you.